Hello and welcome to Life in the Weeds. My name is Alex Ballou. Today's episode, we have Mr. Bobby Stuckey. Bobby Stuckey is a massive force to be reckoned with in the hospitality space. Over the last year, he has been instrumental in developing the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition. He has been fighting with Congress and the Senate to get the restaurants in this country funded properly to sustain themselves throughout a pandemic. He's got a great story. He owns a few really cool restaurants in Denver and Boulder, Colorado. Please enjoy this episode with Mr. Bobby Stuckey. are sponsored by Legacy Home Loans. As you may know, home prices have absolutely skyrocketed this year. If you own your own home, you are potentially sitting on a ton of equity. Legacy Home Loans is saving people two, three, even 400 or more dollars a month by lowering their interest rate and or waiving their mortgage insurance. Also, they're helping people get cash out to pay off credit card debts or other debts and do home improvements like building a pool. Legacy Home Loans can help you skip two mortgage payments. And trust me, there's nothing like taking a summer vacation from spending big money. So contact my friend Eric Parks at Legacy Home Loans, 615-585-4232, NMLS 115-8822. How's your day so far? Great. Real great. Good. Um, Everything's good. Good. Got a busy dinner service tonight? Yep. I'm going to go home and put my suit on right after this. Nice. Nice. Well, we'll dig right in, man. I'm really curious to, to hear your story and to see how you got from being a 13-year-old bus boy making $2 an hour to owning an amazing hospitality company and being a master sommelier and all that stuff in between. I mean, did you always have an entrepreneurial spirit inside of you or is that something that kind of was cultivated throughout the years? Um, I don't know if I really have the entrepreneurial spirit. I think I have a spirit that I love this industry and I love being in it. And I could have gone to, you know, I had spent a long time in my career from busing tables in 1983 all the way up to working at the Little Mel and then going to work at the French Laundry. And then it really, I could have gone two ways. I, I didn't have to become an entrepreneur but I had to be in the restaurant business. That's what it was. And so I was working for Thomas Keller and Laura Cunningham at the French Laundry. I could have either stayed with them forever. I would have loved that. I loved working for them. Or I could have gone and done my own thing with Chef Lachlan and that's how it started. And even when we opened Frosca, the first six to seven years, we didn't do another restaurant. And trying to build a company it took a lot of intervention from my teams that said hey bobby if you're if you're six nights a week on the floor in this restaurant doesn't let anyone else grow right and so that's how we started doing other other spots did you have a hard time letting that go being on the floor working the floor and having that much leadership did you have a hard time delegating that responsibility not once we decided to do that, but I, I did not, um, I'm still on the floor six nights a week. It's just like here tonight, I'll be at Frosca. Um, as soon as we're done with this, I'm going to whip home real quick. Cause I got down to Tavernet at 845 this morning. Cause we had a new hire meeting. So that's why I'm not suited up yet. I'll get there, but I'll be here from pre-service till the last entree goes out. Uh, and I'm still that way in my, in our restaurants. So that's awesome. I'm still very active in the the technical service piece. Yeah, I feel like that dies down. I feel like a lot, I feel like a lot of that commitment to being there all the time in person, the physical presence dies down as you get to a person that's where you are in the business. A lot of times, do you do you believe that's true? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of people develop companies so they don't have to do the mundane, and to me. I don't find it Monday. I like being on the floor. Yeah. We're at, my wife and I are actually coming to Colorado to see a show at Red Rocks on uh, September the 11th. So we may drive up to Boulder to, to come see some of your restaurants. 
Who who you see on the eleventh? Uh, a band called Need to Breathe. They're playing at Red Rocks, um, September the eleventh. So. It'll be, it'll be a cool show and then we were wondering where we're gonna eat and i think i've already figured out where we're gonna eat dinner so i'm excited to come up and try your stuff yeah. um what was the what was, yeah my email uh, email mail yeah. i will do it what was the pivotal moment for you that made you fall in love with restaurants do you remember it was there was there a one thing or just kind of it just slowly happened no it was pretty abrupt i was a punk rock Bus boy in the 80s. I was a very challenged student. I was dyslexic and ADD. I tried very hard in school. It wasn't that I was a not, I didn't apply myself. I tried really hard and could barely get above average. And I have a brother who's born on the same day, two years apart. Wow. School came to him much easier. And I was just not a good student. And then Bussing tables, I had success in, and I liked it, and it was a positive reinforcement. That's crazy. And I was like, oh, I like this industry, and I'm still bussing tables. <laughs> Hopefully, you get a little bit more than two bucks an hour plus tip share now. <laughs> it depends. Maybe not in 2020, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, sure, for sure. Last year was tricky for all of us. Uh, I thought it was interesting that you said. Um, I listened to your podcast with Richard Blaze earlier uh, yesterday, and I, I did a little bit of, obviously, research about you. And I, I found it interesting that you said that, you know, after shifts, you and your buddies would pull your tips and you all would go buy a bottle of wine and, like, compare tasting notes. Whereas when I was growing up in the restaurant industry, we would take our cash tips and go do Jaeger bombs and not remember the evening and you're in the parking lot comparing notes of like this tastes like uh dark chocolate and cherry and this is a great bottle of cabernet and what sparked that that interest you know i worked at i was in flagstaff arizona and there's a place called bricks it's actually where i met another master sommelier richard betts he used to come in as a guest and I, so i've been friends with him since the early nineties, but it was like 1992. I was working at this restaurant and Arizona is what is called a COD state cash on delivery. So the restaurants have to write a check when the delivery happens and the owner would let us the, on Friday, bring in cash and we would pre-order it Thursday, Friday, have our cash, give it to the owner. And he would give, we would purchase That's awesome. something and so we would have an idea of what we wanted to study that week. And there was like four or five of us. And then Saturday night after work, we would go over to one of our apartments and we'd taste that wine. So, you know, and the world is different now. Um, you know, back then in the early 90s, you could actually, actually buy. The whole, the whole distribution model is different too. <clears throat> back then you could buy because of Chateau and Estates how their business model was you could buy aged Bordeaux or buy great Burgundy. Yes, it was, it was expensive, but it wasn't stratospheric as it is now. Right. So it was very, a very beautiful time in, in my life. Yeah. I don't, um, my level of wine knowledge is probably disgusting to you. So we're, we're probably not going to dig into like the depth of wine, but I do, I actually remember the best glass of wine I've ever had. And I'm not a, a really big wine guy, but I was a bartender at a restaurant called Jay Alexander's and somebody bought a bottle of plump Jack and they gave yeah. me, they gave me their last glass as my tip. And I remember drinking it and I probably never had anything better than, I don't know, um, a red diamond Merlot from Washington you know, from a $10 yeah. bottle to a $90 bottle. And I, I drank it. And I remember thinking like, this is like crushed velvet. I mean, it's, it's so smooth and there's so much depth and, you know, I, I would love to get into it, but I just know, I know so little. So kind of discuss what was the, what was the pressure like getting your certificate and being, uh, becoming a master psalm? Well, I think that's where we get this wrong. I mean, the pressure just has to be on yourself. You know, it's not like 
I think if we try to take a timeline away from it and just say, hey, this is my personal journey. When it happens, it happens. It'll be a much better experience. If you're worried about what your coworkers or your peers or the people in your study group think, it becomes a very ominous situation. Yeah. Um, now, it was hard for me. I took many, many steps to get through it, but I was um, very lucky to get through it. But really, the, as long as you don't put a stopwatch on it, it's a much more enjoyable experience. Yeah. I've heard it said that you could spend your entire life studying wine knowledge and you would still never learn all there is to learn about wine. Is that true? Yeah, of course. Because yes, because it's changing every year too. In what ways? Every vintage is different. Producers change. Um, Winemakers retire. Young daughters and sons take over legendary estates. That doesn't, they might have a different vision. Um, Wine regions that were were in hibernation or not planted are now superstars. All these things change. Yeah. I remember, uh, I remember hearing that you're a real big fan of natural wine. Is that true? (laughs) I like wine. uh, (laughs) Trick question. I like wine that's delicious and sound. And I love natural wine when it's well-made. Winemaking is a hard craft and it is a craft it takes years to do perfectly um if if wine is not delicious or what i feel is maybe not made correctly or sloppy winemaking i'm not a fan of that is is natural wine kind of the same idea as putting an organic tab on food because it seems that there's really no It's hard to say what's organic and what's not nowadays. You've got runoff, you've got spill off, you've got cross pollination. So a farm that's organic over here may be sharing a a lot line with a farm that's not organic over here. And so, you know, their, their spray, their feed, it all washes downhill. So maybe this, this organic farm is getting that. Is there a label on natural wine? Is it specific? It's not specified and detailed enough as it should be. And what is interesting to me is there's a lot of, they're working on a lot of designations for naturally made wine, but they haven't pulled back the onion skin and said, hey, what about where it's grown and who is growing it and what happens in the vineyard? I think that should be the most important thing also. Right. Not just if, where the, if it's a 30 uh, where the parts of sulfur is, we should really be paying attention. What's happening in the vineyard? How are those vineyard workers being taken care of? All those things. Okay. So when you went from, if I've got your time timetable, time right, you were a server at Rancho Pino in Arizona. Yeah. And then you moved to the little nail in Aspen. Is that a correct jump? Yeah. So yep. was it, I mean, I looked up the little nail. That place is legit. I mean, it's, five star four diamond it's it's amazing so was it what was the pressure like going from being a server at a place like rancho pino to being the wine director of a four diamond hotel well what happened first was there was a step before that i was in flagstaff i was at a very wine progressive restaurant and i was one of the wine buyers there at rancho pino or at um at bricks so I had a sommelier position, but I didn't think the community in Flagstaff was challenging me enough wine-wise. So I moved back to my hometown of Scottsdale. What might have looked like a step backwards on the ladder was a step forward. Working with Tom Kaufman and Chris Robertson at Rancho Pino was actually a step forward for me in my learning, even though maybe on an, on an on organizational paper. chart, it looked like I was just being a server. Yeah. It really helped me a lot. And then they were the ones, Tom Coffin was the one who connected me with the little now and really pushed me out of the nest and said, here, go up there and be the assistant Psalm. It'll be a reach for you, but it'll be really great. And then after that, my time, I ended up becoming the wine director after that. 
So I didn't walk in there as the wine director. I walked in there as Mark Pape, uh, Mark Pape's assistant. Uh, and it was just a very special team to be part of. Uh, Connie Thornburg, the food and beverage director, and Eric Calderon, the GM of the hotel. It was a really golden era to be there yeah, in the it, mid-90s. It's a beautiful place. I, uh, but I love that you said it looked, you know, on paper it might look like a step back, but really, really it was a step forward. And sometimes that, that those kind of things happen in life where you feel like, God, I'm going backwards, and, or somebody else says, don't do that, that's not the right, that's not the right move. And the next thing you know, that thing propels you to the next level. That's amazing. So what, how did the opportunity for the French Laundry come about? And what was that like? Well, um, I, I had been at the Little Nell for a long time. I loved my job at the Little Nell. I loved working for Eric and Connie. I loved the Crown family who owns the hotel. The guests were great. The wine program was really a lot of fun. Um, the French Laundry at that time in the late 90s was was on a stratospheric rise. Thomas and the kitchen team were doing such amazing things. Laura Cunningham was building that front of the house to be an incredible front of the house. Um, the wine list had been mostly California and they wanted to have an all world wine list. And they also, Thomas wanted to add French wines to Bouchon. Bouchon had opened in 1998 and it was an all California list for this very quintessential Lyonnais style bistro. And um, my name got thrown in the hat to go do that. And it was the right opportunity, uh, excitement-wise, to work with Thomas and Laura and the team there. Uh, it was a great moment for my wife and I to move to a community like Napa, be able to, you know, we couldn't afford a home in Aspen, but you could in the town of Napa at that time period. Um, and just working for Thomas and, and the team there was just awesome. Yeah. And to be able to build that program from an all-California list to an all-world all list, but that was exciting. It was a once in a career opportunity. Yeah, I would just, to uh, to be able to work with the caliber of people that are in that building, they're all there for the same goal. They There's something about waking up and knowing I'm about to go work with a bunch of A-listers. You know, it's everybody's here driving and pushing for the same thing, the ultimate guest experience, the best ingredients, growing our own and celebrating all the things that are great in culinary and hospitality. That's an exciting feeling. I mean, I've worked in restaurants since I was 24. There's something about being said when you, when you're working a service with all the right people and all those cylinders are firing, it's exciting. It feels great. I love it. Um, what did you get the French laundry? Was that, uh, were you, uh, did you help implement the James Beard award for them with outstanding wine service? Is that right? Yep. Most nervous night ever <laughs> was going to the James Beard Awards with Thomas and Laura. Why is that? It's kind of like, a, well, it's kind of like prom night with them. It's a, like a double date prom night. We got my wife and I and Thomas and Laura, and I think uh, Larry Nadeau was with us. And they had won a lot of James Beard Awards for the for the kitchen team. They at that time not won anything for the front of the house. We got nominated. And look, Thomas invested so much in me and the wine team. You, 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 of course, you want to win. Sure. And uh, I was nervous. I was like, it was my first road trip with Thomas. It was great. I, I still remember it immensely and uh, really fondly. I remember afterwards, uh, Tom Clicchio's restaurant, Craft, had just opened. So this was 20 years ago. And, um, Thomas is like, oh my God, we won. Do you want to go party? And I was like, I was still so shell-shocked. I said, no, can we just go get dinner? <laughs> and he goes, okay, it's your night. Where do you want to go? I said, well, Kraft just opened. Can we go? And we went and ate dinner at Kraft. Nice. I think everyone was like, wait, aren't you, aren't you supposed to go out and party or whatever? You, you, you won the James Beard Award. I think I was just so shell-shocked uh, being with with them that night. That's awesome. How long were you there when that actually happened? How long had you been there? I'd been there like a year and a half. That's pretty impressive to take, to take it from it a minimal good. list to go global and then to get recognition from James Beard and all your colleagues. That's, that's a beautiful thing. I mean, that's a testament to your knowledge yeah. and your, and your dedication. Well, I, I think it's more of a testament to the team at the laundry. We just had such a great, 
team there. It was, it was really a lot of fun. So, you know? so what inspired the next move to, to where you got your partner and you decided to go back to Colorado? Mm. So a couple things happened. Uh, one thing life, uh, life uh, experience happened was we lost my mother-in-law, uh, my wife's mom and her father, uh, Dick Alberico, um, was living in Golden, and we wanted to be closer to him. And that was kind of what really pushed us out of the nest. Um, as I said, I could have probably stayed the rest of my career working for Thomas and Laura or go open my own restaurant. And we ended up Lachlan, Danette, and I, and a couple of us opened for Oscar. Nate Reddy, great sommelier, came with us. And um, Brendan Sotokoff, uh, who now is in Chicago, was on our opening team and it was um it was a very um scary time to open a restaurant in boulder colorado uh based on the cuisine of freely venezia julia a very obscure region in a college town that wasn't really ready for a fine or it didn't seem like they wanted a fine dining restaurant but sure it all worked out a okay was it um from a financial standpoint, how did you secure the the finances to open and build and and stock and produce everything that you needed to for your first restaurant? So I had a list of investors from the laundry that were going to help me out, like guests that I had taken care of. But the same gentleman that I went to work for at Rancho Pino, Tom Kaufman, he is a scrappy business person. He helped me. He looked at my uh, business plan and stuff, and he said, "Hey, Bobby." It's your first restaurant. De, de um, program yourself from being in a Michelin three star restaurant. Go find a re- go find a bar, a restaurant, a building that's got HDA or uh, ADA bathrooms and a grease trap. And he like I walked him through like I was selling my house in Napa. It was uh, I'll be brutally honest. Uh, I bought a, a fixer upper for $226,000 in Napa. When I went to work at the laundry, it sold for four North of four sixty. Wow. The equity that I had, uh, that's what I used. And so we did it without investors, but it was a very different Frosca than it is now. Good for you though. It was man. a, yeah, it was a, uh, it was a, gourmet grocery store that had all this equipment in it the guy had gone belly up the landlord was frustrated and the landlord's like i'm not going to give you any tenant improvement but you can sell all this stuff and whatever you make on it you can put into the building and lachlan and i drove around with a u-haul and horse traded that and um (laughs) it was really nuts i love it back on it that's such a good story and that's how we opened. I mean, we opened, we didn't even have like, uh, uh, you know, we, we were out, we didn't even have enough money for the light fixtures uh, or the, the plugs. We had like open wires. It was a disaster. <laughs> um, we were supposed to have three uh, soft opening nights. Couldn't and I just canceled that because <laughs> couldn't afford the, couldn't to give away the food. The food. I just, <laughs> So I, I just opened it. up. I get it. Yeah, we would do menu change, and I like never even tested the menu change. It was just—it's all in my head. Hopefully, it's gonna taste as good as I think it sounds in my mind. So, first person that gets the pork chop and peaches, let me know. I don't know. <laughs> you know I may have to reconsider the whole thing. I love that. How many times have you did? Have you moved Frosca? Have you renovated it? What's that look like? We renovated it. We renovated it um, eleven years ago. We're going to renovate it again this January. Nice. So we've done two redos over the last 17 years. Nice. What's your capacity? Um, right now inside, we're about 65 seats. Okay. Have you, are you 70s. pretty booked out every single night? We're doing, uh, you know, for this era. Yes. We're yep. doing pretty good. Good. That's awesome. Well, I kind of want to move into the whole not sure if you've heard about COVID thing, but um, you're pretty you're pretty involved with the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition. How did that How did that get started? Did, were you involved with the conception of that? And kind of tell everybody about 
how important it is. I mean, I I know these things. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a part of it. I've shared it. I've called my I've called Marsha Blackburn. I've called Senator Haggerty. I've called all these people. I was in line to get the uh, RRF. I had been I'd gone through almost all the steps. I was pending, and then the whole thing got shut down. And so yeah, I know that they overpromised and underdelivered. So. Kind of tell me about the IRC and everything that you've had to do with it. The whole, I can walk you through the whole timeline. Uh, it started March 18th, 2020. Uh, it was 18 of us on a call. Uh, Will Guidera and was kind of leading the call. And that's how it started. We didn't know what was going on. And we just said, okay, we'll be on the call the next morning at 7 a.m. my time. Uh, we finally moved that to 8 a.m., which, thank God, that was killing me. But um, <laughs> we, we, we started that call and we... We, we got we got a little bit of money um, and we hired some political strategists, a.k.a. lobbyists, uh, hired Bolts Communications and Precision. And we started working on trying to save this industry and advocating for this industry. By about May of last year, we wrote a bill with uh, uh, Roger Wicker in the Senate, Kristen Sinema, Earl Blumenauer, uh, Congressman from uh, Oregon was just such, still, the guy is a warrior for restaurants. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sure Erica Palmore, our executive director, and Naomi and the Portland restaurant scene are very close to him, but he's just amazing. We wrote the, we wrote the bill. Uh, the long story is it got put in Nancy Pelosi's Heroes Act, then it went to the uh, graveyard of Mitch McConnell, then it got... And it was written for 120 uh, billion. That's what uh, the, the the economic study that we had done said we needed. At the same time, part of that bill was written that we saw that during PPP, certain groups did not have access during the PPP. So we wrote a 21 day access period for minority owned, women owned and veteran owned access period, not exclusivity access period. Right. With the idea of the 120 billion, meaning everyone was that that was the number that we knew everybody was going to get what they needed. Then when it got put into Biden's package, it was put in. Thank you, Chuck Schumer. Uh, did a great job. As he said, hey, this is a down payment. We didn't get approval for 120 billion. They put it in at 28 billion. And really, I think no one really believed that everyone would figure out how to log in and, and do the application. And the, uh, the IRC, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, did a great job doing these virtual town halls via Zoom around the country, translating it into multiple different languages. That was a success. And in the first 24 hours, three, I don't know the exact number, but close to 300 thousand restaurants apply a lot for sure a lot and the pro the, the only glitch is that it was approved at 28.5 billion it ran out of money that's the glitch yeah it's not a glitch that there was an access period for uh underrepresented people that's sure. not the glitch right. the glitch is it got funded for the wrong amount it was very As schumer low. says it was a down payment. Now we're working really hard. So here it is, July, July 22nd, 2021. It's a year and a half later. I was on a call yesterday with uh, Senator Hickenlooper telling him everything. And he was great and listening and saying, we got to fight for this. He's got, you know, he's on, you know. So we were still fighting it. And the only way out of this, there's only one way out. Unfortunately, Steve Miller filing lawsuits in Texas, that is not the way out. That is a way to politically position ideas. If, if Steve Miller and that restaurant tour really cared about restaurants, they would be getting on a call trying to get this refunded. Yeah. That's, the, that's the only way to do it. Yeah, it shouldn't be partisan. It should not be politicized. It should be roll your sleeves up. Let's get it refunded. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, refund I, the RR. I, I saw that they had to send emails to 
3,000 um, black and women-owned restaurants that had been approved for the grant, and then they had to, they basically retroactively yanked it out of their bank accounts. I mean, it's, you know, that's, yep. that's crazy. You're there, you're literally hanging on to hope by a thread. And then they say, we were underfunded. Sorry. We're going to have to take back the money that we just promised you. That's going to keep your restaurant and your business and all your staff afloat for, you know, who knows what's about to happen in the future. I mean, another shutdown, what, uh, who knows what's coming. So this was something to hang on to. Oh, yeah. That happened to my neighbor. Oh my God. That happened to my neighbor, my neighbor, uh, right down the street, Casey Eastman, she sends me a screenshot thanking me from the SBA that she got approved the amount that she was going to get, that it was going to be funded in three to five days. Yep. Thank you, Steve, Stephen Miller and his super PAC doing his lawsuit. She had it yanked and be devastated, you know, devastated. She, you know, you, you're do, she's doing what she was supposed to do. Sure. She's bringing back employees. She's doing exactly what you're supposed to do with that money. And that money never came. And she's you still, know what? She's still open. See, uh, and be, and if, if Stephen Miller hears this, he can call me. Here's my, you know, he can reach out to me at Frosca Food and Wine if he wants to talk about this. That guy had way enough political clout in the Republican Party Instead of filing a lawsuit, he could call every congressman and every senator and say, hey, let's get this refunded. Yeah. That's what he should have done if he really cared about the American people and American business people. Doesn't matter what color, what race, what gender, if you're a veteran or not, he should have rolled his sleeves up. He, he could have spent a fraction of the amount of time that the IRC did for the 11 million jobs and he could have helped a lot of people. He had a lot more access, yeah, I mean, but he wanted to make it a political statement. We're like the second biggest industry in America. I mean, an, an ungodly amount of small business restaurants have closed in the last year. I mean, mine was one of them. I had to pivot. So I had a fine dining restaurant. We, we had a max capacity of 55. And so now I'm doing meal prep, which it's interesting, but it's working. Um, but at the same time, like when we had restrictions on our capacity, you know, 25% of 55 is not enough seats to open a restaurant and pay a sous chef, line cooks, bartender, manager, servers. It just doesn't make sense. And so we had to figure it out. It's been, it's been, it's been incredibly hard for a lot of people. And there, I did get an email from Marsha Blackburn today. Obviously it was a canned mass email, but it was, you know, thank you for your interest and your support of the restaurant uh, revitalization fund. It's out of my hands now, but it's on the Senate floor and it's going to, you know, I, I can't remember all the finite details, but hopefully it's still alive and still kicking and wiggling. And it's going to make some, make some moves. Yes. Let's hope it does. Um, let's hope it does. And let's, let's hope these, these people quit using, uh, judicial activists or judges with these business people and helping them. Yeah. It's all a bunch of, uh, it's just crazy how much political nonsense there is in so many of these things that we just be Americans, like take care of people. It doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on. Just take care of people. That's all you need to be doing. And it's, it gets so washed out and it's just insane to me. Um, well, that's the COVID segment of our conversation. How do you balance being a business owner with a family? Well, um, you know, my wife and I've been married, uh, 21 years. Uh, I, I do have a unique situation. You know, we, we, my two business partners have children. Uh, my wife and I never had children, but we're a very bonded couple. Uh, I, I do have to say I have a little easier than everyone else. My wife is the craziest night owl in the world. <laughs> I heard you say so, she sleeps very, very late into the morning. Yeah. So she, um, I'll come home from work tonight. She might be on the treadmill at midnight. Oh my gosh, that's disgusting. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it's very common for me in January or February when it's a slower midweek night to call and say, Hey, I'm driving back from Tavernetta in Denver. It was a quieter night. And she's like, Oh, well, don't bug me. I'm about to jump on the treadmill. I'm like, What? <laughs> so 
the, the, the great thing about Danette is she gets, uh, we get to see each other every night at the end of, That's which great. most couples don't get. No, not in this industry for sure. What is it? What does she do? Yeah. Does she, does she work currently? Uh, you know, yeah, she, um, she is in the fashion industry and helps out a, uh, clo- uh, clothing, clothing retail, like high end clothing, women's retail called max. She does all their wi- uh, win- window displays and things like that. Nice. You're and very- she used to work with us here for, for 10 years. Did y'all work well together? I thought so. Yeah. Did she, I loved it. Did she? <laughs> I, I, I wish she came back every night. I, I find now, that. Now, does she love it? Yeah. You got to ask Steve on. <laughs> well, I think you're a pretty fashionable man. So it's obviously trickled down from her to you. She has shared some of the fashion sense with you. I've seen some photos. You're pretty dapper. Oh, she dresses me, oh, so yeah. I can't take any of the. I wish I had a personal fashion person. I don't have. I don't have. I just wear the same thing every day. It's a work shirt and pants. Okay, what are what have been yeah. some what have been some of the hardest learned lessons from being a business owner? I think something that I've been really trying to work on the last couple of years is uh, I, I really enjoy sociology, and. Um, I think for my managers now, um, they have it a lot harder than I, I did in the mid nineties. I think if you look at hospitality, if you look at society, if in the mid nineties, let's say in 19, I'm going to just for simple math. If you were 60 years old in 1995, you were born in 1935. If you were a young manager in 1995 in a hotel like I was at at the Little Mill and you had people that were 60 years old that were born in 1935, yes, you're you're much different age, but that those generations saw things very similar. So they called that the greatest generation, the the people that were in World War II. Mm -hmm. And then you had the baby boomers. And then I, I was born in 1969. That's part of Generation X. We're all three di- different generations, but we looked at things very similarly. Yes. We looked at how long it took to move up the food chain. We were all kind of fine with that work, all those things. Um, now you have Generation Z, Millennial, I'm in Generation X, all this, and uh, they're all totally different. And the thing is, they see the world all through different lenses. They also have different wants and needs and not one generation is better than the other. They're just different. Yeah. But the problem is we have a lot of friction now between the different generations because no one's thinking about each other. Right. No one's thinking about, Hey, this generation has different needs. What they think is important is not what you think is important and vice versa. So a lack of empathy, and lack of empathy and on, on all sides. Yeah. Well, there's such a I mean, disconnect. Like there is such a disconnect between, you know, gen, gen X and the new, the new young bloods. I mean, there's such a technological advance that, I mean, I'm only 39 and I can't figure out TikTok. and I've got these teenagers running around my restaurant and they're like, everything has to go on the internet and it's it's it feels like we're so disconnected when we we really shouldn't be how do you bridge that gap well you just got to talk about it and you got to work on it it's hard i mean there's no easy answer i mean look i mean think about it if you're 50 years old you're of a generation that thinks of work and work-life balance completely different than someone who's 30 Right. And that's a okay. Sure. But also someone who's 30 should also realize, hey, it's not normal to hate baby boomers like you do. <laughs> like when the night before the night before COVID, before we closed, I was taking care of a t- it was the Friday the 13th before the whole shutdown last year. Yeah. And I was taking care of a table at Sunday Vinyl. I was pouring a wine to a large top of young people. And I heard one person say to another young person, Oh, COVID's not a big deal. It's just boomer remover. Oh my gosh. You need to kills old people. 
Now, wow. I can honestly say, when I was in my 30s, I did not want to kill my grandparents or have a disease kill my grandparents. Right. The mere fact there's that much disrespect, uh, we got we to gotta all be more empathetic. And I think that's a hard thing for a lot of us. Yeah, I think on all different generations. I think we've removed uh, you know, so many of our conversations and relationships have have turned to this instead yeah. of, instead of eye to eye and face to face, and so the empathy doesn't exist because you can't see the other person's physical response to a conversation. And body language is so important to be able to read. When you upset someone, you know. Okay, that triggered something. I need to start backpedaling, and so we've we've kind of lost some of that, and hopefully we can get it back. Uh, I think we should, but I mean, obviously there is a disdain for boomers when you've got one of the biggest cut downs of last year was okay, boomer. You know, I mean that's, that's yeah. that shouldn't be a thing. But here, yeah. we, here we are. Uh, what are some of the m- major obstacles that you have overcome to get? the business to where it is now. So you went from having one business that you basically funded by hawking old equipment in a trailer to having, you have three concepts now, is that correct? Uh, four. Four, four. So, Sunday Vinyl, Tabernetta, Frost, and Pizza Locale. Gotcha. So what were some of the major obstacles from going from one to four? Because scale seems very complicated to a lot of people. Yeah, it was really hard for me because I'm not good at it. Uh, my team, I need, I, I, you know, it was just fostering the teams. Um, and we we don't have a game plan on when we want to expand. It's based on when you have the right team and when there's the right, the right uh, economic situation that it makes sense. Did you have a hard time finding those people to be on your team? Did they come to you? Did you actively seek them out? We're, we are a promote from within company. So we've only really hired outside the company a couple times, top level position. Nice. Do you feel so like Peter, who's one of my, go ahead. Peter, who's one of my business partners started as a glass polisher. Wow. That's amazing. I'm assuming the, yeah. bu- the buy-in and the, and the loyalty goes up 10 X based with the promote from within idea. It does. I mean, it's not a no brainer, but it it does help. And I I think it's more enjoyable for everyone who's in the management team to have these people that have worked their way up. Sure. It's more fulfilling for everybody. What do you think some of the most impactful decisions you've made have been either good or bad? Most impactful thing I think we've done was uh, before we ever gave ourselves a dividend check uh, 17 years ago was get insurance for our staff. Uh, provide a matching 4% 401k. Nice. So if you're someone who's a server who's been with us 17 years, you if you choose to contribute, it works out really well. Yeah. Hey, honey, we're moving to Denver. Just wanted to, <laughs> just wanted to tell my wife real fast, pack up the bags. Um, do you have a uh, do you have a mentor or an advisor? Yes, um, I do. Um, you know, I, I still bounce ideas uh, once in a while off Thomas Keller. Um, uh, Eric Calderon, my old boss at the uh, Little Nell, is still in my life 100%. And then there's also people that are not in our industry that I bounce ideas off of. Yeah. Um, you know, there's a, a guest, Larry Jones, who dines with us every Friday. Uh, he helped Lachlan and I. Uh, write the business plan for Scarpetta, the wine we make in Friuli. So that's amazing. There's a, you know, it's the restaurant business is beautiful because you can look outside your industry and get mentorship and, and guidance from people that might not be from your industry. Yeah, but you never know who's dining at your table. I mean, people have a wide array of skill sets and business ideas. So, um, do you have a specific morning routine? Yep, get up and get my run in. You run every day. Except for Sunday Sunday mornings, I go for a bike ride, yeah. Gotcha. How far do you run? It just depends. My my younger brother's out here the last two weeks, so my mileage has gone up a little bit. Because <laughs> a little friendly competition? <laughs> we just really enjoy running together. I mean, we it's really something we've done since we were little kids. 
Um, he broke, he had a, uh, he did not have a return date planned. He just let me know right before this podcast. He's going to leave next Friday. I'm trying to convince his name's Larry, but we call him Scoob. I'm trying to convince him to stay until Saturday. So we can do one more big long run up in the mountains. So we'll see what happens. What does a big long run look like to you? Well, this Saturday, he and I are going to do 18 oh, God. miles uh, up on a road called Magnolia Road. It's at like 8,000 feet. <laughs> so I figured if we did Mags Saturday, he hasn't ran Gold Hill yet. That's another, like one of the classics in marathon running in Boulder. I wanted to take him up to Gold Hill. So we'll see. You've got a lot of mental fortitude to be able to handle working 12 to 14 hours a day and then wake up and go run. 12, 14, 16, 18 miles in the mountains. You're not, I don't think you're built um, normal. <laughs> you know, it's something we just like in, in the Stucky household. It's something my mom was a marathon runner. My dad was, we all dig it. Um, it gives us a lot of pleasure. It gives us that work-life balance. Um, so I don't think of it as that bizarre. I guess some people do. You may not. <laughs> um, I, do, I do have to say last Saturday, I'm going to call my brother out here because he uh, he left me hanging. Uh, usually when the last entree goes out, uh, uh, I get to sit down and have a bite to eat and have an adult beverage. And uh, so I thought my brother was going to come in and sit with me in the kitchen at like the end of the night, Saturday night. And I was exhausted. I was a little dehydrated. I was, he definitely put the wood to me on that run last week and uh i texted him and i thought he was coming he's like oh dude i'm too tired i was like what <laughs> you've been sitting at home watching the phoenix suns lose i'm down here busting my tail working. but <laughs> I, so good. it was a tough night last saturday for me. Well, what do you think the future what's the future of our industry look like to you Well, I've been hearing the same uh, notes from journalists for 30 years that fine dining's dead, and I don't agree with them. I think fine dining it might come back even stronger because people want that connection, that hospitality, and that service. Yeah, I think it's the necessary. Only thing that, it's necessary. The only thing that's hard is it's a craft, and it takes a lot of repetitions, and we lost a lot of people in our industry this year who moved on yeah. so to rebuild those, those institutions will be hard. Yeah. Most, so I had 20, 22 people on staff and all of them except for two completely left the industry. I mean, I'm talking yeah. like went and got a job at SpaceX, went to Disney, went, joined the military, moved to California. My sous chef started his own Mexican like pop-up in Nashville, which is doing very well, but everybody just said, it's just too unknown. So we're just going to move on. Yeah. Got people selling real estate now, which also very weird uh, career at the time. Well, what are three things that you cannot live without? Um, the support of my wife, Danette, very important. Um, having an anchor steam beer when I get home at night before I shower, I, I really like that. Uh, and going for a run and when my brother's in town running with him, but if not the people I run with, Brian Dayton, Craig Lewis, uh, Shannon, uh, Grace, my friends that I run with. It really uh, kind of grounds me. Yeah, you're a real relational guy. I like that about you. I mean, you really you really care. I read something that you said you you heard this lady had a bad experience at your restaurant the next night you, or the next day you called her and talked to her for 30 minutes just to understand what the problem was and get to a resolution. That says a lot. I mean, some people would just read a review and be like, man, to hell with it. You know, everybody has a bad night, but you seek out those problems and try to fix them and solve them and, and put your touch on them. And that, that means a lot to people just acknowledging an issue from the owner. That goes, that goes a long way. Well, you know, we just do our little thing, you know? <laughs> well, it's it's not something that everybody does. Not everybody does it with excellence, and so I applaud you for that. Uh, what are two things that you use every single day? Uh, a few things I use every day. Yeah, two, two things. In the morning. You, yeah, just two things you use every day. 
uh, the espresso machine. Have a, you know, to have, you got to have some coffee every day. Absolutely. Um, I guess the espresso machine in the shower gets used every day. <laughs> well, it's good to be clean. It's good to be caffeinated. So I like that. Yeah. All right. Uh, the last question I have for you is what's the single best piece of advice you've ever been given? Treat it like it's yours and someday it will be. Mm. Well, Thomas Keller. That's strong. Yeah. Wow. So I think that kind of boils down to everybody having an ownership mentality. Yes. That's, that's very important. And I wish, I wish I had had that mentality when I was 24 working in other people's restaurants. Cause I might've been three steps further than where I am now, but that's now being an owner. I see that's something that you want your people to have your team. You want them to have that ownership mentality of this is why you need to care. It's not just what you do, but it's why you do it. And the why is more important yeah. than the what. Yes. So true. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate your time. I know you are super slammed and we spent the first oh. 15 minutes trying to figure out how to make a computer make noise. So. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, man. It was great being on. Can't I can't wait to see you in September when you're out to see Red Rocks. We're coming. And I really appreciate all your work with the IRC and what you're doing to make restaurants last forever. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. I appreciate it. Thanks. Kill it tonight.